right, yes, uh, 1 Timothy 3 is a chapter about partic two particular ministry um, um, offices, I suppose we might call them, and uh, one of them being the elder and one of them being the deacon. And uh, they're different uh, offices of the church, different functions within the church. Both are very important. One is not better than the other. They're, they're all needed. All parts of the body are needed, as we know. And so we uh, are, are always uh, encouraged to know what God has called us to and then step up and do the work that we're called to do. And you never know, you might be called to, to serve the Lord in one of these particular ministries, these callings, these offices, if you will, and um, you might have this upon your heart to do so, and you might need some clarification. I remember the first time when, when uh, I was in a church when I was a very young Christian, and I'd never heard of the office of elder or deacon or anything like that, and uh, the pastor uh, was announcing that he was going to do a, a series and teach teaching about the ministry and what that meant. I thought, oh, I like the ministry. I, I'd like to go and learn about that. And so I went to this meeting, and there's probably about 20 guys there, and uh, he said, uh, who wants to... Who feels they're called to be an elder? And, and he went around the room and he says, Frank, what, do you, what about you? You, called, you think you're called to be an elder or a deacon? And I said, i got to be honest with you, I don't even know what they are. And so he uh, was patient with me, fortunately, and he helped me to understand them. And over time, I actually did become a deacon in the church, and then, and then I went on also to be an elder. And so uh, it, it could be that you're in that position today. Maybe you're wondering, what am I supposed to do? Is there something? This might be something that you might be interested in. So in verse 1, this is a faithful saying, meaning that it's true. It's truthful. It's trustworthy. Take it to the bank kind of a statement. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. And the word desire, the first desire anyway, this first word desire means to aspire to. If you aspire to be an elder or a bishop, the word bishop is actually episkopos in the Greek. It is a word that literally means to visibly oversee with the intention of caring. So you are visibly overseeing a group or a, a, a person. In this case, it's talking about part of the church and you are to care for them. That's the idea of the episkopos, someone who's watching over them and caring for them. We might say elder. We might also say pastor. They're about the same in much of their function, and so that's how we would look at this, the elder of the church or elders of the church. And if a man desires this position, if he is willing to devote his life to it, that's what it means really to desire this work. If you're desiring this position, it, it has to be a noble desire or with a pure heart. And that's the idea. A lot of people just want the authority. They want the, the position because they think there, there is authority attached to it. That's not really how it works. When it comes to the position, the authority is only in the giftings that, that are divinely, I suppose, um, uh, ascribed to the one in the office. And that authority would be that of the Word of God. In other words, it's the Word of God that has the authority. And the bishop, as we're going to see, or the pastor or the elder, is someone who is skilled in the use of the Word of God. And that's really where the authority is. It's not in the person necessarily, but in his calling or his gifting as it, as it relates to the teaching of the Word. And so if you desire to, uh, that position, that's a good thing. Uh, it, it's a good work, he says. And so you're looking at the work that's going to be accomplished through occupying that position. That's really how we must view this if you aspire to that position of elder, that there is a job to be done that needs to be done. It's an important job of, of caring for the flock of God. And so that's what the work is. It's not always easy work. It's not always convenient work. It's not always clean work or pretty work. But it is work, 
and it has to be viewed as, as um, an effort. There's effort involved in doing the work. And so um, it's, uh, don't, don't, don't look at what I do on Sundays and Wednesdays and say, wow, that's a cool job. I wish I could do that. Believe me, there's a lot more involved to it than just that. And so um, it's, it's overseeing. It's caring for people and taking care of as much as you can, as much as is humanly possible in being able to care in that way. But our job primarily is a spiritual one. And the care that we provide for people is spiritual care. And that's the, uh, that's the uh, greatest need that we can provide. A bishop then, if that's what you want to do, if that's what you aspire to do, well, then here's what we need to work on. A bishop then must be blameless. Okay, let's all go home. It's not gonna, that's not going to fly, of course. The blameless uh, idea here is that you're just not guilty of anything, meaning you're not guilty, you're not, there aren't charges pending. You're, you're not going to be found uh, with an accusation that can be proven against you. Now, you want to take this uh, uh, very slowly and carefully because every one of us here is guilty of something. Every one of us can have blame, especially if we're talking about the past. But when we come into the kingdom, hopefully uh, a lot of that past uh, behavior is slowly being worked out of us. Don't make the mistake in thinking that as soon as you come to Christ and you become a Christian, that poof, all of these bad things that were once a part of your life are all gone. Well, it doesn't quite work that easily, does it? The nature has changed, and now comes the learning of the new life and the new habits and the practicing of those new habits. And so, little by little. But that's why he's going to say in a little bit, this is not a position for the young believer at all. This is someone... That's thus the term elder. He's older in the Lord. He's older and more mature in the Lord. And so hopefully all of his blame days or guilty days will mostly be behind him. And uh, he's not one who is notoriously sinning. If he is, then he shouldn't be serving in this position as an elder. Uh, he's to be the husband of one wife. Uh, you know, it's... Um, a simple little phrase, and yet it has caused tremendous division and, and opinion and debate as to what that one little phrase means, the husband of one wife. Now, if you were to just take it at face value, one might think, well, he should be married to one woman at a time, right? But if you think about it, in this day, there were Jews and pagans who had other wives, they had more than one wife. And so it's very possible that is what it's talking about, that you can't be a bishop if you have a harem. It's kind of like that. It's one thing. Uh, some people want to say, no, if you've ever been married and you know your, your wife died and, or you got divorced, then you are completely disqualified. And that's reading a lot into this, and there's reading a lot into the Scripture, and so some people do want to say that. But let me put it more simp even simpler than that. A husband of one wife just simply means you are, you, you are married to the woman that you love, and you're going to stay devoted to her. You, you're devoted to that one woman. And the reason that's important is he's going to compare the, the, the eldership to the, the leadership over the church. This principle of devotion to your wife and your admiration to your wife is a characteristic of how you're to minister to God's church. You're devoted to it. You're faithful to her. You're faithful to the church. You're going to be committed and you're not going to be running around looking for other things and other enjoyments. You are committed to the work that is at hand in the church you're committed to your wife, and that's the idea. You're, you're stubbornly attached to the woman that you're married to, and that's the way it's supposed to be. The husband of one wife, temperate. The word temperate is a word that means uh, self-controlled or balanced is a good phrase. 
balanced and that your mindset is not going to be one day you're way over here, the next day you're way over here. There's a balance to your life. You're well balanced in the way you're approaching it. Now, this word temperance, if you think about it also, can, is a word that we used in conjunction with drinking and that one would abstain from drinking. It certainly can also mean that, but as we're going to see, there's, it's more, more or less a balanced approach to drinking as opposed to complete abstinence. Uh, we'll see that in, in just a little bit. So temperance, meaning you are in control of yourself most of the time. Uh, sober-minded or clear-headedness, you're able to think clearly, you're able to have your thoughts under control, and you're not, um, you know, uh, you're, you're not someone who himself might need uh, psychological counseling, let's say, or you're, you're balanced to the degree that you are able to help other people, which is your job. And someone who is of good behavior. Good behavior here is one that's, uh, it, it means, um, well, good. You're good. You're a good person. You, you are um, a dignified person. You are someone that is honorable or respectable in the way he behaves. And uh, you're, not, uh, you're not scandalous. You're not going to embarrass the Savior. You're also someone who should be hospitable. Hospitable in this day of the day that this was being written was very important for travelers who would come through. Hotels, you couldn't find the Ramada or the Motel 6 on the corner as easily as anyone else, as, as you can today, I mean. And so when Christians were traveling from town to town, they would often need lodging. And, well, the elder could, should be willing to open up his home to be able to house these traveling brothers and sisters who were coming through. And hospitality is a very good uh, trait. It's an old-fashioned trait. We don't necessarily see a lot of that in the same way we would have in that day, but it is a good trait, and it's something that um, always re, uh, offers warmth and kindness to people, especially those who are traveling. And able to teach, and this is what I was talking about, the bishop or the elder is someone that should be able to teach. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that the elder is going to be able to stand in a pulpit and, and teach the Word of God necessarily. My point is, is that in this day, when Paul was writing this to Timothy, they didn't have pulpits. That's not how they would sit and teach. They would actually gather probably in, in a circle, mostly small circles, and then explain the word. They would read the Bible and explain it, much unlike what we're doing here on Wednesday night. But a person, an elder who is uh, skilled at teaching or able to teach, is someone who can explain what the Bible means. And you keep it in mind, too, in that day, they didn't have the Bible, per se. They had the Old Testament. And so they would take the Old Testament and explain Jesus from the Old Testament. Then they would receive a letter from the Apostle Paul, and Timothy would grab it, and he would read it, and he would say, oh, guys, let's get together. I want to read to you what Paul said. And then he would sit and read this letter to them, and he'd say, what he means is this, and this is how we should behave, and, and, this is, and, and so there came the explanation of the teachings that were given through the Christian teachers and prophets. And so we had, they had to explain that, and that's what a teacher or an elder is. An elder who is able to teach understands the Word of God and is able to explain it to someone so that they can understand it themselves. That's a very good thing. So not everyone stands in front of people to teach is why I'm saying this. Sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes it's just a couple of people or in a small group. That is also someone who functions as an elder who can explain the Word of God. He's able to explain the Word. And in, here in verse 3, he says he's not given to wine. The words literally mean from the Greek, he is not an addict. He's not addicted to wine. Uh, think of the culture, in the culture, in that day, everybody, probably most everybody, drank some wine. They had some wine that they were drinking. 
It, uh, many uh, have the argument that it was a different type of wine, and it certainly was. I think what we learned uh, when I was in Rome, we learned that it was a different type of a wine, that it was a spiced wine with different flavorings in it. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you've ever been to Germany, but they have a Christmas wine that they heat up and they cook it with spices. And you could smell it and as you're walking through the Christmas market and then smell it, it smells nasty. And you just know that's what they're, what they're cooking. Uh, but a lot of the wine was a spiced wine. Uh, but they say, well, the wine was different than it was non-alcoholic. This is just ludicrous that anyone even thinks that because of course there was alcohol. They called Jesus a drunkard. Paul the apostle tells us, do not be drunk with wine. How do you get drunk with wine if it's non-alcoholic? Of course you're going to get, it had alcohol in it. So the idea here is that you cannot be addicted to the stuff. Anything that controls you as an elder, you're in trouble, and you've got to get out of that. You've got to get away from that. And that's, that's what he's saying. If you're any Christian who's controlled by something else needs to get out of that. So uh, the, the real principle that uh, I've taught you before with any alcohol of any kind is that if you cannot maintain, then you must abstain. If you cannot maintain, you'd better abstain and stay completely away from it. The word temperance that we talked about can also mean abstinence. So be careful. If you can't control any of your liberties, then you have to stay away from those liberties and you must presume it is not your liberty any longer. So it may be someone else's liberty, but it may not be your liberty. So keep that in mind. The, the, I do not believe the Bible forbids drinking. It forbids drunkenness, and it, forgets, it forbids foolishness when it comes to things like this. So be very, very careful with your liberties. Uh, he says the elder should not be violent, a violent person, uh, a, a bully. Don't be a bully. Elders who are bullies, of course, uh, uh, are, um, are, are not, not good for the ministry. Do not be greedy for money. Also in the middle of verse 3. This uh, filthy lucre is the King James wording, and it means ill-gotten gain. Money that comes to you through not very kosher ways. You're getting this money in the wrong way, you know, uh, and, and you can't be loving money to the point that you want to do something um, questionable to obtain it. And so the elder, the bishop, is to be better than that, higher than that in his thinking. And so you can't be approaching your ministry for the sake of money. But you're to be gentle in the sense of being fair. You're to be kind and fair. That's the elder's uh, disposition, if you will. And uh, you want to become that. And listen, you know, we're talking about a lot of things here. Um, when you come into the faith, a lot of, a lot of the times, you can, become, you can be naturally some of these things. But then there are those who are not naturally these things. And so the idea is, sure, you want to have this position, but there should be a certain sort of quality of individual that's going to occupy the position. And so work on these areas of your life. Go and work on these areas of your life. I can assure you that in all of these areas, as we go through the list, there's, there's still more. We're only halfway through. But there's still more qualifications for the position of elder. Just because someone fulfills or fills the position of the elder doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be great at all of these things. He should, however, be working or moving in the right direction with these things becoming part of his personality, part of his nature, part of his character. These, if you will, are spiritual graces. But as you go through them, you realize this isn't really just for the elder. This is what Christians are to strive for. We're all supposed to be of this type of quality, this type of character. It's not just the elder's position. But what I think Paul is saying is, if you're going to occupy the position, then you really need to be a little further advanced in your spiritual maturity so that these things are in better control. 
Uh, guaranteed, I guarantee that there are some of you in this room that are better at some of these things than I am. But I can tell you that we are all striving to be better at these things. And that's the idea. And uh, so we may put a person who's in, who, into this position of elder, and they may not be very strong in this area, but they'll be really good in all of the other areas. <clears throat> and we expect that in time, all, those, all the areas will catch up to themselves. So that's the hope. In case you were going through this list and you got it burning in your heart that you want to be an elder, you believe you're called to be an elder, but you think, I'm disqualified after the second, third one. I'm, there's no way. That's okay. Just keep working with the Lord, keep walking with him, and watch how he continues to change because he doesn't put these desires in your heart unless he wants you to fulfill them. And so these desires to be in this position to do the work is from the Lord. If you just want the position, that's not from the Lord. That's from your ego. But if you want to do the work, then it's, it's from the Lord. Uh, uh, one who, uh, oh, he goes on and he says, not, uh, gentle, not quarrelsome, meaning you're not argue, argumentative. You're, some, sometimes we can do that, you know, especially when we become skilled with the word. You become skilled with the word right away. You, you, you know, the, the sword of the spirit. So you want to pull out your sword. You want to go toe to toe with someone. You want to, you want to do some sword fighting with, with someone who thinks he's a wise guy or he's smarter than you. And you don't want to, anyone to be smarter than you. So you're going to pull out your sword. Well, you don't need to do that. Sometimes you could be so right that you're wrong. And so you don't want to do that. Try not to be an argumentative person, nor do you want to be covetous. Now, uh, we've got the, the greed for money, which is the love of money. And then uh, covetous is the love of material things, things that are material and often the things that other people have. I want what he has. What, do you, what would you like for Christmas? I want what you have. You know, that's not, that's not the way you're supposed to be. You don't covet material things. We have to let them go. Be less attached to the material things. I, I, I think this is a hard thing um, in many ways, but at the same time, uh, it's part of the Christian nature to be letting go of things that are attached to this life as much as possible so that we can be about our Father's life, that spiritual life. With that, you, verse 4, you need to be, a bishop needs to be one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all um, reverence. He, he, this is a difficult one. This idea of ruling his own house is the idea of one who is a proper caregiver and provider for the home, caring for the house in that way. Very often when you have the, uh, the, uh, the man who thinks is a spiritual leader will say, and uh, He's concerned about the church, but he doesn't care for the house. His priority is the church, it's not the family. And, and that can be a problem all around. And so uh, Paul says, no, you, you got to be a, a caregiver to the home. You can't abandon your responsibilities there. Because if you do, you're going to have a problem with your children. And the idea is, if you're caring for your home as you should, then your children will grow to be respectable children. And the idea here is that you have children who are in submission with all reverence. Some kids, well, they hit those years that are a little more difficult. They come through the teenage years. And if they survive them without you killing them, uh, then, then you'll be able to see that teenagers actually become, they, they, they become adults. <laughs> they, move, they move on past those difficult years. They're a little more tolerable. And then when they start having grandkids, they get in the way again. But uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, uh, what you want to see in, in an elder and his qualification for this position is that basically his kids are fairly, fairly in order without being notoriously part of the newspaper headlines. You don't want them to be troublemakers and they're going out of control because then what has to happen it's not that he's necessarily disqualified from the position of elder but then it may be better for the elder candidate let's say 
to remove himself from that realm so that he can focus even more intently on what's going on at the house. Take care of the home. If you can't get the home in order, well, he tells us this. He says uh, in verse 5, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Well, the answer to that is poorly. (laughs) If he can't control his house, he's probably not going to be able to control God's house. And so take care of the house. Make sure everything's in order. Deal with the problems that might be there. And then you can advance later. This is not like it's off the table because, well, your kids grew up to be um, gangsters, you know, or whatever. You might have an opportunity to turn everything around and uh, sometimes at the same time, you know, you can do everything right with a kid and they can go wrong. You can do everything right with your children and they can still make bad choices for, their, for themselves and ruin their own lives even though you've done everything right. Everything you know right to do and still they may turn out to be bad. So, of course, every case would be different, and so you look at everything uh, individually. Verse 6, the elder is not to be a novice, meaning a baby Christian. Neo, neo, I forget the Greek word, neophulite, I believe, which means a new shoot a new shoot a like we would say a a fresh freshly planted tree he he can't be so new in the ground uh just this this week i uh uh, bought a couple of um, olive trees and they're only about this big they're only about you know three inches tall actually when i got them they were they were two inches they've grown an inch since i planted them but anyway they're so tiny and so fragile that I'm afraid to leave them outside right now. I actually have them inside. But it's because they'll break so easily. They can't bear up against the winds of, of the outside. They can't hold up even against, you know, probably little birds that might want to pick around the, 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 the dirt. And so I have to keep them inside and protect them before thinking that I can hang a swing on them. You know what I mean? So the idea is, that's, that's what the idea of this word is, not a novice, not a new shoot, not something so new that it can't really hold up. But that often is the case, and many times we'll see that happen in, in churches, is that we just want a warm body, and if you're breathing and you're alive, would you like to be an elder? And uh, you oh, sure. I don't know if you've ever been to some churches, but everyone in the church has a title of some sort. Everyone's got it. That can't be possible. How could everybody? Is you know what they say? Too many, uh, too many chiefs and not enough Indians. That's sort of a, a bad recipe. Well, you, you, either they're qualified or they're not. And it's better. I have found after many mistakes, I have found that it's better not to have any elders for a while until you can develop men qualified to be able to fill that position. It's better to to wait a long time until. Until you realize, I can't do the work alone. We've got to have more help. And then you look for qualified people who can go in that position. But they shouldn't be baby Christians. They shouldn't be new, newborns into the faith. They certainly need to have some mature legs so that they could bear up against the pain or the work of the ministry. And there's a lot of it. And so uh, not a novice. And there's another danger, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Boy, that, that should scare you. The idea is when you put a, Christ, a young Christian in a place that he shouldn't be, the chances of him getting his head knocked off by the devil are pretty good. The chances of that happening are almost probably more so than them not happening. So you want to be very careful in putting someone who's not qualified or too immature in the faith. They shouldn't be there lest he be puffed up. The word puffed up means up in smoke. That's what it means. He, he just blows up in smoke. It's, it's uh, like a poof and it's gone. That's the problem. You don't want someone who shows potential to be put in a position that will never realize the potential because he's just too young. 
He doesn't have the stamina for the long-range ministry. And so you cannot do that. It's, it's, it's not fair to the individual, certainly not good for the church. And you as the pastor, leader of the ministry, are going to pay for it as well. So don't do it. They will be puffed up with pride and fall into the same judgment or destiny of the devil. Oh, what a terrible thing. And so you don't want to... You don't want to put someone in that position. That would be a, a terrible thing. Moreover, he must have a good testimony. He needs to be a good witness. What is he like? His testimony among those who are outside, meaning outside of the church. What kind of a Christian is he when he's not at church? Good question, right? Now, I said, as we're going through this, this is the qualifications of an elder, but I also said, these are the things all of us as Christians need to be thinking about and concerned for. What kind of a Christian are you when you're not at church? That's important. And the idea is, is that if you want to advance further in the growth and knowledge of the kingdom, then your Christianity has to take over every part of your life. Wherever you go, you are still the child of God and you are a Christian. And your life should reflect that. And that's, of course, especially the case with someone who professes to be an elder or aspires to be an elder. Why is that? He says because uh, uh, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So one is the condemnation of the devil. One is the snare or the trap of the devil. What is the trap? It's the trap of hypocrisy. One is the trap of immaturity and pride, which leads to pride. And then, of course, the other is hypocrisy, that you think you can behave two different ways depending on where you exist. And you say, well, that's, you know, I, I can compartmentalize. <laughs> no, you're a hypocrite. And that's not what you can be. You've got to be Christian everywhere. And your behavior at the church should be the same when you're at your job or when you're at the market, or when you're at somewhere else. And it's important. It's very, very important. I was in a doctor's office the other day, and uh, they kind of messed up my, my uh, appointment time, and, and I started to get a little bit mouthy, I have to confess. And uh, I started to get a little bit mouthy, and when I get in those positions, I, my flesh just sort of wants to take over, but I don't want to give it permission to do so. And I start getting sarcastic. It's a terrible thing. My poor wife. And you have, you, have to, you have to see this, you know. And I'm sitting there and I want to say something. And she walked away and, uh, to go and check on it, right? She probably walked away to, you know, start talking about me in the back. And I would have deserved it. I would have deserved it. But, and I'm sitting there thinking, darn it, why did I do that? I... Just shut up. You know, I was talking to myself, stop being a big whiner. It's, it's going to work out, and even if it doesn't, it's just an appointment, you go back and do it again. You know, it's no big deal. And, uh, well, I got my way because I cried enough of my hissy fit. But I felt bad about it, I have to say, because I don't like even that little... It wasn't bad. I didn't make a scene. And fortunately, it was just her and me in the room and no one else, but still... It was enough for me to say, to, to have a convicted heart, to say, you were a jerk. She didn't have to tell me. I already knew it. And so, uh, and I repented of it and, and had somewhat of a good day. It wasn't that great. But anyway, that's the idea. You want to make sure your testimony outside among the non-believer is a good one. Lest uh, you fall under reproach. The world is going to have something to say about your hypocrisy. They're going to point it out, and you're going to feel terrible. Or, even worse, you'll get away with it. And if you get away with it, the more you get away with it, that, see, that's the trap. The devil wants you to behave like a jerk, and, and then he wants everyone to know which church you go to. That I don't like. That's, that's something that would be a a stain on the reputation of Christ. So we don't want to do that. So be careful. Now, we move from the elder and we go into the deacon. Likewise, or in that same manner. Meaning, 
uh, your deacons uh, pretty much are under the same requirements as the elder, and they're about the same. Different positions, different functions. They do different things. Um, you first, we first see the idea of deacons in Acts chapter 6. You remember that story there where the church was growing and growing and growing and and the elders were serving people and trying to feed everyone and and while they weren't able to do a good job of it because not only did they have to serve everybody, they also had to to teach the word and and, and people started grumbling and complaining and so they kind of got word from the Spirit of God that they were going to change that and they had to look for men who were gifted and filled with the Spirit to be able to wait on tables. That was, their, that was their job. In other words, you handle these things so we can handle these things. And their things, the elders, were required to teach the Word of God and pray, to care, to oversee the flock. That was their concern. Whereas the deacons were responsible to make sure that all of the other needs were cared for. And that's really how we function here at uh, Calvary Chapel and yet we kind of all see ourselves as deacons also we're all deacons i i think which which literally means a king's servant a deacon is a king's servant and uh, i think that's what we are right if you belong to jesus he's our king and we serve him so we become then the king's servant and the uh, also the word diakonos in the greek the word for deacon later actually developed to be the, the word used for a waiter, <laughs> a, a person who serves tables. And so that's what a deacon is. And, you know, it's funny because you get, uh, you, know, you get some churches that appoint deacons and they think they're like the gods of the church and they become a bit of a problem. But deacons are king's servants. And so we have to always view ourselves as, as lowly in that way. We're just servants, and that's the way we have to always see ourselves. So with that, the deacons must be reverent or respectful. They cannot be double-tongued. We would say uh, two-faced. And two-faced is someone who's trying to save face, and so he talks to this person about this and says this, but then he goes to this person and says the opposite, trying to put his face toward the one whom he's talking to at the moment. Two-faced or double-tongued. You cannot be a person who doesn't let his yea be yea and his nay, nay. You have to always keep your word. Uh, This deacon also cannot be given to much wine. Um, He's also not to be an addict of any kind. He's not to be greedy for money. He can't be in it for the money. He's to hold the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. It's a kind of a beautiful phrase there, that we all are to hold the mystery of the faith. What that literally means is to be deeply committed to the faith. A deacon is not a doofus. A deacon is not someone who just can't do anything else, so we'll make him a deacon. No, he is someone who's deeply committed to the Christian faith And he could do the work of an elder, but that's not his job. That's not his calling. That's not his position in the congregation. He does other things. And yet, he's so deeply committed to the faith, so much so that the way he lives his life, he can live it with a pure conscience. He hasn't done anything wrong. His faith translates into his walk. And so he lives his Christian life publicly with no shame whatsoever. But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. There's that word again, unaccused, or even though they may be accused, there's nothing there for it to stick. The accusation sort of bounces off because there's no truth to the accusation. But the deacon, it's not someone that you just say, who wants to be a deacon? Okay, you can be a deacon. You over there, Yeah, you, it's three of you. All right, we got enough. Three deacons, come on. Let's go do something. No, deacons, like the elder, really, there has to be a track record of their holding fast to the mystery of the faith. There has to be that evidence of a deep conviction of the life. And so these 
positions are people that need to be examined. The word here, to be tested, is the word dokumazo in the Greek, which is a word that means to document. You document the life. Take a look at it. What's it look like? Take notes. Make sure that it's, it's matching what they claim. And so, as you see, these are not positions that are take, to be taken lightly. They should be respected positions. And so, uh, to be in the position of a deacon, uh, you want to be examined, and then any ex- accusations against them can be eliminated. Now, it says in verse 11, likewise their wives must be reverent. Their wives. Now, uh, if you look at your Bible, something interesting, I, I find this an interesting verse. They did, it, it, Paul didn't mention the wives of the elders. Did you notice that? There's no requirement for the elders' wives. The requirement is for the deacon's wife. Or, that's not what it's talking about at all. Likewise, their wives must be. Do you see the words there and must be? In my Bible, and probably yours, those words are italicized, which means that they were added by the translators of the English Bible in order to give us a better flow of the sentence structure. And so when you look at this, it might be saying, likewise, wives. Or, more specifically, the word for wives in the Greek can be taken in two ways. The word is gune, or gune, not guni, gune, <clears throat> and is a word which can mean wife or woman. It's, it's very common, even in languages today, in the German language, for instance, the word Frau. You know that word Frau. You've heard Frau before. The word Frau means wife, but it also means woman. So depending on the context in which you use it will determine how someone would understand it. I would say, this is my Frau. That means that is my wife. Or you'd say, take this over to that Frau over there, to that woman over there. Depending on how you use the word, would be how this word is understood. Well, when you look at this, he says, likewise, women. Now, which women? It seems odd that he's talking about women when we're talking about ministry positions. Some have suggested that he's talking about women deacons who are serving in the church. It's possible. I'm not saying that's what it is. But it's very possible, because otherwise it seems odd to me that he doesn't mention any requirements for the wives of the elders, but only the wives of the deacons. And that's, I've always interpreted, I've always looked at it that way, that it refers to the wives of the deacons. But as as I've studied it and re-studied it, I'm, I'm almost wondering if maybe Paul wasn't specifically saying that there were women deacons serving in the church as well, and that these women deacons need to be reverent or honorable. They need, they need not to be slanderers. The Greek word for slanderer is diabolos. Any uh, Spanish or Latin speakers or Italian speakers, diabolo is the word for devil. It's the word. It's, uh, uh, you don't want to be a devil. So devil, of course, meaning a gossip. You don't want someone in your ranks being a gossip. That's always damaging to be gossipy. Here's the word temperate again, that these women, whoever they were, were to be temperate, meaning balanced and in self-control. They need to control themselves. They need to control. If it's drinking, they better control it. If it's talking, they better control it. If it's their personal habits, they better control it. Anyone who is temperate needs to control themselves. It's self-control. And that they're to be faithful in all things. And all things, I don't think you have to make a list there, But he says, your character, your nature, your disposition is that you are a a faithful woman. And he mentioned also the elder was to be faithful too. So we know that it crosses across the board. It's not about just women. It's not about that. This is ministry. I'm, I'm more and more convinced that what Paul is talking about is women who serve in the ministry. Whether they're deacons or whether they're serving in the ministry, we do have 
lots of women who serve in the ministry. This is a requirement for you. These are things that you're to be responsible for in your personality, that you are in control and faithful in all things. And back to the deacons, and here's again, this doesn't make sense to be talking about women in general or possibly their wives, but let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, of course, the same thing there, and ruling their children and their own house as well. So similar requirements as the, those of the elders. For those who have served well as deacons, obtain for themselves a good standing or a respectable standing among others and great boldness in the faith or boldness, a great confidence that you will have in the faith as you serve the Lord uh, well as a deacon. Uh, and then you have great boldness or confidence in the faith, which our faith is in Jesus Christ. And this must have triggered something for Paul as he hears this, this faith which is in Jesus Christ. And and he goes on and he says, now these things I'm writing to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. That really was his plan, to come shortly. But, but in case I don't make it, in case I'm delayed for whatever reason, I'm writing these things so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. So these are the, the behaviors of the Christian family. The household of God, the Christian family. That's who we are. This is what we have within the ranks of the church. We have bishops, we have, we have deacons, and uh, we have women ministers. We have all of these people all working for one common good, which is the Christian faith. And as we all do our jobs, we expect that we're going to have a great confidence uh, of, of in our faith in, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, so um, I'm writing that you know how to behave. And uh, I'll tell you, it's a, a good thing when we have these instructions and we do our best to stick closely to them as much as possible. We can go to the book of Acts. We can try to find how a church is to behave today. You know, there's not a lot of great detail on how church is to be uh, held or how how do we hold church? How do we do church? It's not always easy to know that. And that's why there are so many different opinions. We, we call them denominations. We're all one body, those who are true Christians. We're all one family, but we seem to all have our different preferences. And that's okay. How many of you have, have a brother or a sister, and they live just a few miles away from you, and your house and their house are really two different things? But you're still one family, you still love each other, but you behave differently. And that's okay. We have one family, it's gigantic, it's global. It crosses all kinds of generations. But in each different household, we behave differently, and that's perfectly okay. We don't um, need to uh, begrudge anyone for doing things differently. But often it boils down to how we understand what the Scripture is telling us. And if we're paying attention to the Scripture, you'll notice that, that there isn't a lot of great detail on the way we're supposed to do it. So that's why this passage here in 1 Timothy becomes so important. These are things that we know. This is how we're supposed to behave, so we should pay attention to them and then start applying them as we can. And so we learn how to behave in the house of God because he calls it the church. The word church here not used a lot of times in the New Testament, but it is used a few times. It's the word ecclesia, and it is the word which means an assembly or called out ones. We are the ones called out to assemble. We are assembled together. And so when we come to church, we are assembled together. We have this phrase, the house of God. Is this the house of God? It is only the house of God when we have ecclesia when we have gathered here, that's what makes it the house of God. When it's not here, it's my office, if that makes sense. And God doesn't live here unless you're here to bring him here, so to speak. And uh, yes, we can go on. God is everywhere. Yes, we know that. He, he's everywhere. But the point is, people refer to churches very often as the house of God, and so did Paul. 
but he's saying it is the house of God when we are assembled in it. And that's what we can say. It is the assembly of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And I, I think it's appropriate as you think of, if you've ever been to the uh, um, uh, ancient lands, to Israel, Greece, uh, Rome, columns and pillars, gigantic, tall, all over the place. And Paul is seeing this, writing to Timothy in Ephesus, where all these pillars are. You know the pictures you've seen of, the, uh, of Ephesus and the, and the temples that are out there. These columns are enormous and still standing today. And they're huge. And Paul is, is making a, a picture here for Timothy to see. Those pillars hold up everything. They're very important. But they were also prone to earthquake. And so those pillars are all toppled over, and a lot of them are toppled over in those ancient lands from earthquakes. And so here he's saying the ground or the foundation of the truth. But this word ground of the truth, these words, really means the, the stabilizer. The church stabilizes the truth in a sense, and it holds it. Think of the term buttress. A buttress is a, 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 uh, something that you lean against a wall, let's say, to, to make it stronger, and you're able to hold it up. And that's the idea of the Christian church. And the Christian church is to hold up the truth. We're to be the foundation of the truth, the, the bearers of truth in the world. And uh, that's why it's important we get these things right as much as we possibly can. And without controversy, without question, that's what he's saying. There's no question about this. Great is the mystery of godliness, or what an incredible faith we have. What an incredible belief we understand this gospel to be. What this mystery of godliness, or our faith that leads us to godliness. And he goes on to explain it in, the, in this version of the Bible, God was manifest in the flesh. Some versions just say, who was manifested in the flesh? Or Christ was manifested in the flesh. In the Greek, from the way I understand it, the word is theos. That's God, right? So the word for theos is God. So I think the word God is proper. Now, if you read it that way, wow, what a verse. God was manifested in the flesh? What is he talking about? Remember first, in the first chapter of John, the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Then in the 14th verse of that same chapter, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we understand, the way we interpret that is that Jesus is God who took on the form of human flesh. That's exactly what Paul is saying. Wow, great is this mystery of godliness that God was manifested in the flesh. He came in the likeness of humanity and inhabited our lives. This word manifest is made visible. John brought that up, remember? No one has ever seen God, but Jesus Christ has revealed him. Paul says it a little differently. God was made visible in the flesh. How? Well, let's go on. Justified in the Spirit, justified in the Spirit meaning, or justified by the Spirit, or proven to be the Christ and divinity through the Spirit, declared by the Holy Spirit that he is the Son of God, seen by angels, witnessed by the angels, observed, the angels looking in and marveling at this reality of Christ, God himself, taking on the form of human flesh. And that's what we preach among the Gentiles. Think non-believer now. We preach these things among the non-believers. We are the Gentiles. Paul was the Jew. His mission was to the Gentiles, so preached among the Gentiles, preached everywhere. Important because Jesus is who we're talking about in context Jesus was a Jew preached among the Gentiles. Someone was telling me they had a friend, a couple friend or family member that, that just hated, hated Jewish people. 
And uh, I asked, are they Christian? Yeah, well, they believe, they believe in Jesus. Well, did they know Jesus was a Jew? Because sometimes we forget that. You, you, it just doesn't make sense to be a Christian who hates Jews. Since Jesus was a Jew, it just doesn't make sense. So you kind of have to get rid of all hate. No matter, no matter who you think you hate, you'd be wrong. So you want to get rid of all of that. Preached among the Gentiles, preached among the world, really. Believed on in the world and received up in glory. And this is the story, of course, of Jesus. This is the life and the mission of the incarnate Christ we're talking about Jesus Christ. So this verse, verse 16, Jesus is God. That's what this verse is declaring. And we have other verses that, that say the same thing. But opponents of this teaching just don't want to believe it. So fortunately, there are many places in the New Testament that actually teach us that Jesus is divine. He is the Son of God. He is God incarnate. And so we worship that God. And wow, as Paul would say, Great is this mystery of godliness. Without question, it's an incredible teaching that we have the privilege of being able to give out. But as you go through these qualifications, please do not be discouraged. If you sense a call to one of these things, continue growing and walking with the Lord. And then you might seek out one of the leaders of the church and say, you know, I, I'm thinking of that. Let's, let's see what we can do and we can begin working in that direction. We always need more um, qualified men and women who want to serve in this church. And I actually like that verse as being translated, uh, likewise, women of the church who want to serve. And I think we have a lot of women who do that. So men or, man or woman, serving the Lord is a good thing. And I hope you'll consider taking it up to another level. And Lord, as we hear these things, you've called each of us to certain gifts, to certain callings and, and positions and offices. And we pray that you'll help each of us to know what those callings are so that we can be faithful to fulfill them for your glory. I pray you'll help us, all of us, to guard ourselves against the, the problem of wrong motives. But at the same time, you do touch us, you call us, and you lead us into different locations for your purposes. And so, Lord, count us in. Use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>